Well, Tony, we've uh, covered the briefing now for the IFR departure from Denver, the en route portion over the mountains, and the ILS approach to Palomar at Carlsbad. Can we get into some non-precision approaches because they're troublesome for me. I, I shoot an ILS every time I have a, the possibility. And my last NDB approach I think was worse than the first one that I ever shot as a student. Yes, what, what you're experiencing, Jack, is common occurrence among business pilots. You see, they own an airplane to save time, so when they reach the destination airport, they'll accept the visual approach, weather permitting, or they'll shoot an ILS if an instrument approach is necessary. That's what I do, yeah. Well, most major airports have excellent ILS uh, facilities, and the pilot should use them whenever possible. It's the safest and surest method of landing on the first attempt. However, not all airports are equipped with instrument landing systems. And even airports that have an ILS system may be using some other type of approach due to weather or failure of the ILS system. And now you're forced to execute some form of non-precision approach. And you know, there are many variations of each type of non-precision approach. At any rate, at the very least, Jack, you should regularly practice making the uh, non-precision approaches, if only in a good simulator. I can understand that. but. Non-precision approaches, I'm of the opinion that they're more difficult to fly and, to my mind, more dangerous. You don't have precise vertical or horizontal information. You run into the problems with uh, wind and timing. You have to use several nav aids quite often to get in. And those are just a few of the problems, Tony. Well, of course, that's all true, Jack. And yet, with practice, even the imprecise NDB approach can be flown with a great deal of safety. Hmm. You know, we discussed the ILS approach in our last briefing. So now I'd like to cover the various kinds of VOR approaches and the NDB approach and the ASR approach in some detail. Now the localizer only approach, localizer back courses, the LDA, SDF approaches, well, we'll cover those in somewhat less detail. And wherever the DME information is provided on VOR and ILS approaches, we will determine if and how that approach can be made without DME information. That'd be good to know. Now, I'll also divide this briefing session into three sections, Jack. First, we'll describe the segments of the instrument approaches, and then I'll cover some uh, pilot techniques, which sure. uh, should help you uh, make the approach safer, and it'll make, maybe, make, maybe make it easier for you to fly it. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we'll describe each of the non-precision approaches. You know, Jack, today there are over 5,600 approved instrument approaches in the United States. Hmm. Now, approximately 2,380 of these, and that's about 42% are VOR approaches, so okay. that's the most numerous type. Hmm. And then the, the NDB approach uh, approaches are the next most uh, numerous, and there are about 1,600 of these. That's around 28%. I think I've shot them all. <laughs> uh, many of these NDB approaches are associated with the ILS system, but in some cases, it's the only approach available to the airport. Now. There are only 865 ILS approaches, approximately 16% of the uh, total published approaches, but it's the most used kind of approach by the IFR pilot. You know, there are also over 400 charted RNAV approaches, about 160 localizer-only approaches, around 140 localizer back course approaches, 34 SDF and 21 LDA approaches here in the United States. Now, in addition to that, there's about 300 airports that have charted radar approaches. Uh, Tony, would you refresh my memory? Uh, I have an idea that an SDF is a small direction finder and the LDA is a limited directional aid or something like that. <laughs> well, you're close, Jack. Uh, an SDF is a simplified directional facility okay. and the LDA is a localizer type directional aid. Now, I'll mention these and discuss them again later in the, in the briefing. Fine. You know, every instrument approach is made up of segments and some some of the instrument approaches have all four segments, but other approaches can be made by completing only two of the segments. Now, <clears throat> let's start our briefing by explaining these segments. During this briefing, we'll be using the uh, United States Standard for Terminal Instrument Procedures, or the TERPS Manual, the AIM, some advisory circulars and other government publications, and selected Jeppesen charts. By the way, Jack, do you have a, uh, a current AIM? Well, if by current you mean uh, three years old, yes, I have an a, uh, AIM, but I still use it occasionally. You know, not enough pilots realize that the information in the AIM is directive in nature. Hmm. The popular belief is that the AIM is only informative. 
you know, the pilot can be held legally responsible for information published in the AIM. So I strongly suggest that you subscribe to this publication and then use the major, the uh, explanation of major changes page in here as an easy way to keep abreast of the changes in procedures and regulations. So what you're saying, uh, ignorance of the regulation is no excuse. That's true. Well, that makes sense, and I'll do that. Uh, can I have the subscription form out of there when we're done? Oh, better yet, Jack, uh, take the uh, manual. Oh, thank you. And uh, now you'll get a new copy about every three months once you subscribe. Okay. Now, TRIPS manual section 214 states that an instrument approach may have four segments. Well, excuse me. I have trouble, you know, knowing where I am on the approach, what segment. And I always <coughs> don't have the idea of what I'm to do on the next segment. Well, that's understandable. Many pilots have that same problem, Jack. But you must learn to visualize your position constantly during an IFR approach. And when you can do this and standardize all your procedures, your instrument approaches will automatically be safer and much easier for you to negotiate. Now, as I was saying, there are four, as many as four segments okay. to these approaches. There's the initial segment, the intermediate segment, the final segment, and the missed approach segment. But when a feeder route is designated, you might want to consider this a segment of the approach as well. You see, the TRIPS manual says that in some cases, it is necessary to designate a feeder route to safely na navigate from the en route structure to the initial approach fix. See, the en route airway obstacle clearance then will uh, apply on the feeder route. Hmm. The uh, minimum altitude established on a feeder route, however, should never be less than that established for the, for the initial approach fix. Otherwise, you'd have to fly up to it. That's correct. You see, a feeder route begins where the aircraft leaves the en route structure and ends at the initial approach fix. Now, in most cases, the instrument approach commences at the initial approach fix. On the initial approach, the aircraft has departed the en route phase of flight and is now maneuvering to enter the intermediate segment. On, on an initial approach uh, may be made along an arc, a radial, a course, a heading, a radar vector, or any combination of these. Procedure turns, holding pattern descents, and high altitude penetrations can also be initial approach segments. Now when holding is required, prior to entering the initial segment, the holding fix and the initial approach fix should coincide. The initial segment shall provide 1,000 feet of obstacle clearance in the primary area. The initial segment is not limited to any specific length. The initial approach segment begins at the designated initial approach fix and ends when the aircraft turns inbound to the final approach fix. Remember, intermediate fixes are not always designated on the approach plates. Hmm. Now, for many reasons, the intermediate segment may be the most important of the segments to the instrument pilot. Why? Well, you see, if you don't take charge of the approach management, ATC may eliminate this segment. Now, this often happens when radar turns you on to an ILS approach at or inside the final approach fix. Now, we'll discuss some ways to avoid that in the pilot technique section in just a few minutes. But when the intermediate fix is a part of the en route structure, an initial segment, segment may not exist. And in this case, the approach begins at the intermediate fix and the intermediate segment criteria apply. A minimum of 500 feet obstacle clearance is provided in the primary area of this intermediate segment. Remember, the obstacle clearance in the initial segment was 1,000 feet. Now this is the segment which blends the initial approach segment into the final approach segment. And here is the last chance for you, the pilot, to stabilize the aircraft prior to the final approach segment. And so your approach speed, your mm -hmm. configuration, your power, and trim adjustments are made here prior to crossing the final approach fix. Well, at any rate, Jack, treat the segment just prior to the final approach fix as the intermediate segment and do all of these things, mm -hmm. even though uh, the segment could but double as the initial segment in some cases. Now, insist on a segment here with at least one minute or two miles of straight and level flight before crossing that final approach fix. The intermediate segment, remember, begins when the aircraft crosses the designated intermediate fix or turns inbound toward the final approach fix and ends at the final approach fix or point. Now, now wait a minute. Uh, final approach point. Uh, I don't remember seeing that on any chart. Well, Jack, an example of when a final approach point might be used is when the nav facility is located on the airport and DM DME information is not available. 
it's a point on the final approach course where the procedure, after the procedure turn, where the pilot may begin his descent. The final approach point serves as the FAF and identifies the beginning of the final approach segment. Now, I'll illustrate this in the approach segment of this briefing. Oh, good. This is the segment, this final approach segment, is the segment in which alignment and descent for landing are now accomplished. A final approach may be made to a runway for a straight-in landing or to an airport for a circling approach. The final approach segment begins at the final approach fix or point and ends at the missed approach point or at touchdown. Remember the visual portion from the MDA to the runway is part of the final approach segment. Remember a stabilized final approach is dependent upon crossing the final approach fix in the proper configuration and at the proper speed. Otherwise, you'll be chasing the airspeed, adjusting the power, and retrimming throughout the final segment. Sure. And of course, that kind of approach, uh, it could raise the pucker factor to an uncomfortable zone. Yes, and I've been there several times. <laughs> so we all have, I'm sure. Now, the missed approach segment, I think this is the most casually treated by instrument pilots. And after you apply go around power, there's no time to try to study the procedure. And yet many pilots have shortened their day by turning in the wrong direction or not making a required turn immediately following the missed approach point. Just memorize two, two, things, two things about the final approach. I'm, I'm sorry, about the missed approach. Mm -hmm. you remember what those are, Jack? Uh, direction of the turn and altitude. That's correct. Remember direction and altitude and highlight these on your uh, chart. Mm -hmm. Now, the TRIPS manual says that a missed approach procedure shall be established for each instrument approach. Now, this missed approach procedure should begin at decision height or at a specified point in a non-precision approach. Uh, you know, the main purpose of uh, the publishing this uh, missed approach procedure is to describe for the pilot a course of action expected by ATC in the event of lost communications. However, missed approach instructions issued by ATC should be, they, they will supersede the published procedure and should be executed by the pilot rather than the published procedure. Now, for obstacle clearance, you should make an effort to climb at least 500 feet per minute beginning at the missed approach point. The missed approach primary area is based on a 40 to 1 slope, and this converts to a climb gradient of about 152 feet per nautical mile. So you must convert this to feet per minute for the airspeed that you will use on the missed approach. When an obstacle penetrates this 40 to 1 slope jack, a higher rate of climb may be necessary, and this will be noted in the miss on the missed approach instructions in on the plate. Okay. Report the missed approach to ATC as soon as is practical. As you know, uh, this can trigger a series of exchange of information, so you should have the aircraft established on the missed approach and have it fully stabilized before making that initial call. Now, you should also be prepared to answer that first question that ATC will ask, what are, are your, your intentions? intentions? Right. Yes. Uh, of course, you have several options at this point. And here are just four examples. One, you may request another approach. Two, you may hold while checking weather at nearby airports. Or three, you may hold awaiting better weather locally for another approach. Mm -hmm. And you may proceed to your alternate airport, but remember that's only mandatory if all communication has been lost. The missed approach segment is located between the missed approach point or decision height and the missed approach fix at the prescribed altitude. You know, radar may be used to vector the aircraft to the intermediate or final approach fix. And when you accept radar vectoring, you are on a segment of the approach, feeder, initial, or intermediate and the appropriate obstacle clearance criteria will apply. Hmm. Uh, however, the prudent pilot will continue to monitor his position using available nav aids while being radar vectored. Now, we discussed how this is best done during the ILS briefing. When within about four miles of the final approach fix under radar control, or if you're flying a heading, you should consider yourself on the intermediate segment and do all those things that are necessary to prepare for crossing the final approach fix and entering the final segment. It's good to know because I get a lot of radar vectors. Well, you know, DME arcs may be designated as initial or intermediate segments, and when arcs are prescribed, the initial segment usually begins at the point where the aircraft joins the arc. The intermediate segment begins where the aircraft joins the radial or localizer prior to crossing the final approach fix. 
On ILS approaches, when the angle of interception between the arc and the intermediate segment exceeds to 90 degrees, a radial which provides at least two miles of lead-in shall be identified to assist in leading the turn onto the intermediate or inbound course. Now this is not necessary for VOR approaches because the movement of the needle is slow enough to allow the pilot to follow it to the inbound course. There are, uh, these arcs are generally no further than 30 miles, nor any less than seven miles from the navigational facility. And the width of the arc is the same as an airway, that is a total of six miles each side of the center line. Now the first four miles each side of the center line is considered the primary area and the last two the secondary area. The same as, as on an airway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now the obstacle clearance conforms to the segment on which the arc is used. That is if it becomes the initial segment then 1,000 feet of a uh, clearance is available or if it is used as an intermediate segment then 500 feet uh, clearance is, obstacle clearance is provided. Holding patterns when used as a segment of the approach replacing the procedure turn must be flown as depicted on the chart. The descent from the minimum holding pattern altitude to the final approach fix may not commence until the aircraft is established on the inbound course. Remember you should not execute a procedure turn unless number one it has been authorized by ATC or number two a procedure turn is depicted as part of the instrument approach procedure. Okay. Now I'll say more about holding patterns in the pilot technique section of the briefing, Jack. So now let's go on to some techniques that you as a pilot can use while executing instrument approaches. Now I'm only going to touch on a few techniques at this time. I'd like you to develop your own ideas and habits and that way you're more likely to use them on every approach. But every pilot should have a plan, a routine in mind before beginning an IFR approach. And the first thing recommended by instructors and FAA check pilots is an IFR checklist. Now we discussed a sample format of an IFR mm -hmm. uh, checklist remember. in the ILS briefing. But I want you to develop your own checklist. I have by and large. Good. Uh, too often a pilot will neglect items while approaching the terminal area and then just before the final approach fix he finds himself busier than a worn-on paper hanger during mosquito season and you must plan ahead. Plan the workload so that it is spread out fairly evenly throughout the approach. Now the first item on the IFR checklist will likely be ATIS, ATIS. Sure. Now listen to the airport information as far out as practical, Jack, 15 or 20 miles and be ready to advise the approach controller that you have the current information. And now that you know which is the active runway and the approach in use, pull that approach plate out and look it over carefully. Now take the time to mentally fly the approach segment by segment. Use a highlighter and highlight important data that you might want to recheck during the approach itself. Now, of course it's best to study and make the approach, uh, mark the approach plate uh, during the flight planning phase if that's at all possible. Sure. Now, take a look at other approach plates for that airport. Make a note of information that may be useful for the approach that you're going to execute, but which is not available on that approach plate. I'll demonstrate how useful this can be in the next segment of the briefing. Uh, in most cases, the weather will permit a visual approach. However, you might want to uh, retain or improve your IFR flight proficiency, and I suggest you do so. So, on the initial contact with the approach controller, request an instrument approach and when the approach is approved inform the controller that you want to execute the published approach with the appropriate transition. Now this puts you in charge. You now know where you will make turns and descents and there'll be no surprises. Mm -hmm. Now if radar is used to vector you to the final approach fix, ask the controller to turn you on at a designated fix or one mile outside the gate. Now this will help assure that you will have an intermediate segment wherein you can stabilize your aircraft for that final approach segment. Be sure to identify a NAV facility before you use it to make an IFR approach. Now I've noticed that many pilots do not actually listen to the code. As soon as they hear a few dots and dashes, they turn the sound off. Now they've probably been told that if maintenance is working on the equipment, that maintenance will take the identifier off the air, but that the uh, signal may still be broadcast. Now, the AIM uh, s says in chapter one, and I think it's paragraph three, uh, they state that during periods of maintenance, the facility may radiate a test signal, that is T-E-S-T. -E hmm. 
Now this is another insidious trap for the unwary pilot. Here is an added danger for those who don't or can't read the code. Now why don't they use a warning signal of some kind that cannot be mistaken? Uh, a different tone, for instance, or a series of just dots. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm with you so far about speed control. Uh, and my Baron, uh, where should I slow to approach speed? Well, <clears throat> I'm glad you brought that up, Jack. Some pilots cross the final approach fix of cruising speed and configuration, and others slow to 1.3 VSO while approaching the uh, while they're still approaching the initial approach fix. And both ways can give you and the controller a heap of trouble. The AIM says the pilot should slow to approach speed when within the three minutes prior to crossing the initial approach fix. Uh, but remember, this is not the approach speed referred to in your aircraft owner's manual. Now, that approach speed should more accurately be uh, referred to as a threshold crossing speed. Using that speed in most twins on final would cause you to, flow, to fly the aircraft below the, uh, the blue line on final. It's too slow to mix properly with traffic at busy airports, and if you encountered a wind shear or wingtip vortice, you would not have enough inertia to carry you through to a safe recovery. Now, it's a good idea to inform the final controller of your intended airspeed on the final, and now he can properly space you in, in the traffic flow. Okay. Now, you should pick a speed that's comfortable to fly and within the capability of the autopilot system, because sometimes you will make uh, autopilot approaches. Usually, twin pilots like, oh, about 120 knots from a point somewhere outside the intermediate fix until the field is in sight on the final. That's what I use, yeah. Now, at about 200 feet above the airport, or approximately 3,500 feet from the end of the runway, about where the middle marker is normally located, you can reduce power, deploy full flaps, and slow to 1.3 VSO as you cross the threshold. Now, it's very important during a non-precision approach that the speed remain as constant as possible from the final approach fix to the missed approach point. You see, this is the timed portion of the approach, and speed is crucial to uh, accurately establish where the MAP might be. Now, this can be a problem unless you know the power settings for the desired speeds while using various configurations and for descent as well as level flight. And that's why we established the speed chart for your aircraft prior to beginning the training. Yeah, and I, I found that chart to be very helpful uh, when I'm making instrument approaches especially. Another technique, Jack, that I'd like to stress is staying ahead of the aircraft. Now, to do this, you must know where you are at all times while in the terminal area. If there's an area chart, be sure to use its unique features to help you locate your position. Project your position on the chart by two or three miles. What will you be doing then? Descending? Turning? Intercepting a radial or bearing? Now, prepare for that event. Don't wait for the ATC instructor or ATC controller to call anticipate and be ready for the instruction that you will receive. Sure. Now, while flying IFR, always use a headset or a boom mic and a boom mic. The advantages are uh, manyfold. Uh, outside noises are practically eliminated. Your hands are free to fly the aircraft. Uh, you could reply to ATC requests much faster. Chances of a stuck mic are greatly reduced, and if a speaker or an audio panel fails, you're still in business. And it facilitates copying instructions as well, since you only have one hand free to uh, uh, either hold a mic or write on the pad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when ATC issues an instruction, they expect you to execute the maneuver upon receipt. Now, they expect climbs and descents to be at least 500 feet per minute and turns to be standard rate. If you can't comply, inform ATC at once. As a matter of fact, if you can't comply with an ATC instruction of any kind or for any reason, inform the controller immediately. And he will, ins you see, he will not insist that uh, y you do something that your aircraft's not capable of doing. So he will issue alternate instructions. As a matter of fact, you may even request an alternate course of action at any time if you desire. The controller will approve if it's possible. Now, when you're in the terminal area, make an effort to use all the available navigational equipment in your aircraft. For instance, don't leave the number two nav on a facility 80 miles behind you. Use the NDB, any available DME information, the radar altimeter, altitude alert devices, electronic timers, LORAN, RNAV, ground proximity devices, or anything else that you have aboard. Now, for instance, I use radar altimeters and altitude alert devices 
to remind me to recheck my gear at about 400 feet on visual approaches, especially at night. Uh, it caught me with no gear in at least two instances in which I might have been caused to join the those that have club. One more thing, repeat back to the controller all headings, altitudes, altimeter settings, and transponder codes, in other words, numbers. Pilots often mistake one number for another. For instance, they will fly a 250 degree heading instead of leveling off at flight level 250. Now, if the if the FAA could establish a definite way of expressing differing information, I think it would help prevent potentially disastrous situations. For example, when I was flying the DC-6, we call for manifold 25 for a power change and flaps 25 for a configuration change. Some numbers, I'm sorry, these are the same numbers, but different applications. Sure. Now, NASA's free a uh, free publication called Callback nearly always has a few examples of this sort of error reported by airline pilots, military pilots, as well as general aviation pilots. As a matter of fact, their latest issue shows that this is the most common type of error that occurs. Hmm. So stay alert, Jack, and repeat all numbers for confirmation before acting on them. I certainly do that. You know, I, uh, you said that we would, you'd mention holding patterns again. I find that I'm not asked to hold often, but it seems that when it's requested, I'm in unfamiliar territory, and I'm not always certain how I should enter the pattern in the, the limits of the protected airspace, Tony. Well, <clears throat> remember that the entry method, which is described in the AIM, is a suggestion only. Mm -hmm. And the main point is to enter without violating other protected airspace. Now, take a look at a typical holding pattern here. Basically, if you are approaching the holding pattern, or approaching the holding fix from the holding side, make a direct entry. That is, cross the fix and turn outbound. If you are approaching from the non-holding side, cross the fix and either execute a teardrop entry or a parallel entry, whichever requires the shorter turn. Now, word of caution, do all of your maneuvering on the holding side of the holding radial. In other words, stay in the protected airspace. Okay. Uh, also notice, Jack, that most approaches which use a holding pattern for course reversal specify a one-minute leg. Well, that's fine if you're making one turn around the pattern and then executing the approach. But when you're given instructions to hold, you should insist on an expected further clearance time if it isn't given to you. And this is in case of lost communications. If that time will require several trips around the pattern, then ask for a larger pattern. Aren't you always get a, given an EFC time, Tony? Usually, but occasionally when they're busy or when the weather is uh, um, not down to minimums, they sometimes don't issue that. So what you're saying is I should ask the controller uh, for two or three minute uh, legs while holding. Well, that might be okay. You know, but most pilots don't like having to keep track of time on each circuit. Uh, most facilities on which that you will be holding have DME information. So ask for a three or four mile leg. You see, three miles will always be right here, mm -hmm. regardless of the wind. Now three minutes might be here in a headwind and here in a tailwind. I recommend on the initial circuit that you use either a two minute or three mile leg. I have seen pilots cross the fix, turn into the wind, begin the time when the wings are level, turn back to the fix after one minute, get blown past the fix before the turn is completed, and then they're unable to locate the fix again. Meanwhile, they have vi violated miles of protected airspace. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, Jack, that at some time you've heard airlines asking for 10-mile legs while they're holding. Now, in your plane, four miles would be sufficient. See, now you don't have to note the exact time the two from needle switches position, and you don't have to hit the stopwatch. You can turn outbound and relax until you reach about four DME. But be sure to get permission from ATC, otherwise the controller will fear that you are lost and about to enter forbidden airspace, and he'll surely give you a call. But I've never been refused this request. Hmm. Now, as the time for your approach nears, you can adjust the pattern to cross the final approach fix as near the designated time as is possible. Now, always confirm that you will be allowed to make the approach while you're on that last outbound leg. Now, just one more tip. When turning inbound to the fix, if the VOR needle has not left the peg as you come through 45 degrees to the inbound course, 
stop the turn and wait for some movement. Then continue the turn based on the speed of the needle movement. If the needle begins to center too early in the turn, you can steepen the bank, but don't steepen it over 30 degrees. Do this to lessen the overshooting of the inbound radial. Now, each depicted holding pattern is surrounded by a buffer zone of additional protected airspace, but don't plan on using that space. It's designed to uh, provide added safety while you're holding. Well, these are all good suggestions, and uh, I know we've talked about it before. I, I'm starting to find that uh, using an instrument checklist and standardizing my approach procedures are helping me to remember uh, to use the techniques on every approach. Well, Jack, like any habit, the more you do it, the easier it becomes until you find the procedures almost automatic. Now, in the next section of this briefing, we'll be talking about various kinds of non-precision approaches. I'll discuss some of the variations of the VOR approaches and how to fly them. For the most part, you can use the same principles when flying the NDB approaches. Now, I'd like to examine the most used versions of the VOR approach in the following order. One, VOR on airport. Mm -hmm. Two, VOR off the airport, but you must cross the VOR. Three, off airport VOR beyond the airport. All right. And four, the step down approaches, five circling approaches. Now I'll explain the difference between the final approach fix and the final approach point and how to establish a final approach point. Good, I'm waiting for that. Now first let's consider an on airport VOR with no final approach fix depicted on the instrument approach plate. The VOR for runway 6 at Frankfort, Kentucky is a typical example. The VOR is considered to be on airport if it is located within one mile of the nearest portion of the landing runway for a straight-in approach. Now, if no information is provided down here in the speed table, you can consider the VOR an on-airport facility. Mm -hmm. Now, here you arrive at the initial approach <coughs> fix via an airway or uh, on a feeder route. The procedure turn is part of the initial approach segment. Now, this course reversal must be completed as we see here within 10 nautical miles of the VOR. Now, Jack, once again, the depicted procedure turn is only a suggestion. Now, to avoid confusion and to save time, I prefer the 80 degree to 60 degree turn. Try it, I think you'll like it. You'll find it described on page 95 of the FAA Instrument Flying Handbook. Uh, that's Advisory Circular 61-27C. Now, I believe if a procedure is easier to execute, it's a safer procedure. Now, however, if the course reversal is designated as a teardrop or it's a holding pattern, then it must be flown as depicted on the approach plate. Okay. Now, this kind of approach has no intermediate segment designated. Therefore, I treat the entire procedure turn as an intermediate segment. That is, I use it to configure and stabilize the aircraft for the final segment. The final approach begins where the procedure turn intersects the final approach course inbound. The alignment of the final approach course determines whether a straight-in or a circling approach will be established. Now, will you tell me the difference between a, a straight-in approach and a straight-in landing? Well, if you're IFR, a straight-in approach is one where the final approach is begun without first having executed a procedure turn. Now, it's not necessarily completed with a straight-in landing or made to straight-in landing minimums. A straight-in landing is a landing made on a runway aligned within 30 degrees of the final approach course following completion of an instrument approach. It is usually made to landing, uh, IFR landing minimums. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, on a straight-in landing, the final approach radial can be offset from the runway centerline by 500 feet, or the angle of convergence can be as much as 30 degrees. Now, what I'm saying, Jack, is that when you break out, even from a perfectly flown straight-in landing, you may not be lined up with the runway. Mm. The obstacle clearance in the primary area on final approach is a minimum of 300 feet for straight-in approaches. When the final approach course alignment does not meet the criteria for straight-in landing, only a circling approach is authorized. The course alignment is then made ideally to the center of the landing area but it may pass through any portion of the usable landing surface. I, uh, I didn't realize that. I thought it would be like to the center of the airport. Mm -hmm. And Jack, I'm sure you realize that when no DM in DME information is available, timing becomes critical to stay within the protected airspace. 
complete the procedure turn within the designated distance. Now, after turning inbound on the final, begin descent to the MDA. Now this is the final approach point. No information is given in the speed table at the bottom of the chart because the VOR is the missed approach point and it's on the airport. Now, a problem sometimes is encountered in this kind of approach when the initial segment is into the wind. Now this happens when making circling approaches. Sometimes the procedure turn is completed too close to the station. There's not enough time or distance to descend to the MDA before recrossing the VOR. You might not be low enough to be in visual contact with the ground, so a mist approach is necessary. A feel for the effect of the surface wind will help assure a more successful approach. Now, the VOR needle becomes more sensitive as you approach the airport on this kind of an approach. And for this mist approach at Frankfort, Kentucky, an immediate climbing right turn must be made while climbing to 2,700 feet. Now notice at MDA you are only 250 feet above the highest obstacle in the airport reference circle. The on-airport NDB is flown basically the same way as the on-airport VOR. It's the easiest type of NDB approach to fly accurately. Mm -hmm. Seems so. Well, Jack, <clears throat> there are two general types of off-airport VOR approaches. Those approaches where you fly toward the VOR and those where you fly away from the facility while you're on the final segment. Now here's an example at Elkhart, Indiana, where the pilot must fly across the VOR and then away from it while on the final segment. There are several ways of entering this approach. You may be vectored to the initial approach fix at the South Bend VOR. Now, notice the no procedure turn area on this chart, Jack. This is a fairly new procedure, and if you enter via an airway anywhere in this sector, no procedure turn is authorized. Now, course reversal is accomplished via the holding pattern. If you are holding, you can expect to begin the approach directly from the holding pattern. Now, you know this because the holding pattern is shown in a thick black line, indicating it is a segment of the approach. Now, in some cases, like Needles, California here, for instance, the approach cannot be made directly from the holding pattern. Now, there are several reasons why this may be true, and they're all outlined in the TERPS manual. But as a pilot, you need not know the precise reason. The thin line depicting the holding pattern indicates that it is not a part of the, of the uh, instrument approach. So you must complete the procedure turn and cross the VOR final approach fix, in this case, at 3,700 feet. Okay. Now, Goshen, Indiana's VOR to runway 9 is an example of the VOR being located beyond the airport. If you begin the approach from the Goshen VOR, you can fly a feeder route to the initial approach fixed, fix at Sony's intersection. However, since radar is available, you might be vectored to the final approach uh, fix from any position in the terminal area. Now, after completing the procedure turn within 10 miles of Sony's, that is within 26 DME, you cross the final approach fix at 2,500 feet and enter the final segment. If you do not see the runway environment at the visual descent point, that is 12.2 DME, well, you might as well prepare to execute the missed approach. Now, you can execute this missed approach at any time on the final segment, but no later than 11 DME, which is the missed approach mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Notice that you are authorized to make this approach without DME but then you must be able to identify Sony's so that you can time the final approach segment to the missed approach point. So therefore, a second VOR would be required. Now, strict attention to distance and or time is critical on this type of approach. Remember, when executing a non-precision approach, our initial descent from the final approach fix to the MDA should be at 800 to 1,000 feet per minute to assure reaching the MDA prior to crossing the MAP. Now, this means that a special effort must be made to keep the airspeed constant while on the descent as well as while flying level at the MDA. Sure. Now, one of the most dangerous non-precision approaches can be the circling approach. All instrument approach plates provide circling criteria. Many airports have only a circling approach capability. The VORDME at Ramona, for instance, is one of these. That's in Ramona, California. The size of the circling area varies with the approach category of the aircraft. Now, most light twins are in category B, 
and so are protected up to 1.5 miles from the ends of the runways. Now, there's no secondary safety zone in a circling approach. Within the circling approach area, you are provided with 300 feet clearance above the highest obstacle. Pilots are warned not to leave the minimum circling altitude until landing is assured. Mm. Now, parts of the circling approach area may be eliminated, Jack, where prominent obstacles exist. If a landing can be made without entering these dangerous areas, then a note may be included on the chart designated the prohibited, designating the prohibited area. Now, once you're cleared for the circling approach, the entire circling approach area outside of those designated areas is yours if instrument approach conditions, if instrument conditions exist within the uh, circling area. Mm -hmm. Now, you should fly the shortest path to the base or the downwind lake. You may even overfly the airport to keep the active runway to your left and in sight. But don't bank the aircraft more than 30 degrees during the approach. Remember, low altitude, low speed, and steep turns are a terrible combination. Sometimes, though, VFR or other flying is in progress within the circling approach area. Now, this is often the case at remote fields. If a tower is operating and the weather is above IFR uh, minimums, then just follow the instructions from the tower. Sure. If the runway is lost during the approach for any reason, execute an immediate missed approach. Begin a climbing turn toward the center of the field and then join the missed approach procedure. Don't loiter at circling minimums hoping that you'll see the runway again. Frankly, Jack, I will not even attempt a circling approach if the weather in the circling approach area is at or near IFR minimums. It's just one of the limits that I place on myself as part of my life insurance program. Probably a good idea. Now, step down permits additional descent within the segment of the instrument approach. This step down concept allows a much lower MDA at many locations, but you must be equipped to identify the step down fixes. Some approaches will have a series of steps or as obstacles are overflown on the final. However, there will never be more than one such fix between the final approach fix and the missed approach point. The step down fixes will be identified by DME distances or across radial from another VOR. When only DME is used to mark the steps, as we see here at Boise, Idaho, then it is designated as a DME approach in the heading up at the top of the approach chart. And of course, your DME must be operational to even commence this kind of approach. The VOR non-precision approach can be difficult to fly from the MDA to touchdown at night if no vertical guidance such as VASI is available to the pilot. The pilot can suddenly realize he is either too high or too low on the approach. The FAA has approved the visual descent point to help make VOR approaches safer. The VDP is indicated by a small V on the profile view and it defines the point at which a three degree glide slope from the touchdown point would intercept the MDA. Now usually a DME fix is used to mark the VDP, but a cross radial from another VOR or the 75 megahertz white airway beacon may be used. The pilot should stay at the MDA until reaching the VDP, then establish a normal three degree descent, about 600 feet per minute in most light twins, to the threshold. Now, of course, the runway, en runway environment must be in sight prior to leaving the MDA. Well, I've used the VDP. Uh, why isn't it used on all VOR approaches? Well, they're working on it, Jack. You may have noticed that new ones are added almost weekly. But, if you don't, but you don't have to wait for them to be published. If there is a VOR approach that you use regularly, make your own visual descent point. You, you say that I'm legally allowed to create my own VDP on any VOR approach? Well, actually, you do it all the time, Jack. Think about it for a moment. You have to leave the MDA at some point if you mm -hmm. intend to land. And if you can determine where a three degree slope would intercept the MDA, mm -hmm. then that's the ideal place to leave the MDA and start your descent. Great, but how do I determine where the VDP would be positioned? I uh, sometimes make night landings in Freeport, Illinois from the Janesville VOR. Show me how I can uh, establish a VDP for that approach. Okay, <clears throat> at 120 knots, your rate of descent will be approximately 600 feet per minute on a three degree glide slope. You can find that from the speed charts at the bottom of most uh, IFR plates. Now that'll give you around 300 feet per nautical mile. Now first subtract the field elevation, in this case 846 feet, 
Okay. from the MDA altitude of 2,500 feet, and we find that we must descend about 1,600 feet. Mm -hmm. Now divide this by your 300 feet per nautical mile, and we find that the VDP must be located about five miles from the touchdown point. Uh, touchdown is about 28 miles from the VOR, so the VDP should be placed at about 23 DME. Notice, notice, Jack, how we round out these numbers to facilitate rapid mental calculation without having to use a calculator. Now when we reach the 23 DME point, your visual descent point, use the same procedure as you would on an ILS final. And that will make you, take you to the touchdown point as though you were flying an ILS glide slope. Sounds easy. Well, just keep in mind that the distance is calculated from the touchdown point to the MDA and then measured from the VOR. Now, Tony, I don't have any particular trouble shooting VOR approaches. I know that if I respect the minimums on the approach chart and stay within a protected area, VOR approaches can be flown, to my mind, pretty safely. However, several times a year I have to make an NDP, NDB approach. Sometimes I get a bit confused somewhere between the beacon and the airport. I remember you told me that NDB stands for uh, uh, something like, I've got no damn business doing this. Uh, is there any way to make this approach easier? Well, <clears throat> it seems there are more concepts of how to fly the NDB than any other kind of approach. Now let me tell you how I do it, Jack, and then you can develop your own methods, and you okay. will in the end anyway. First, an NDB facility may be located on the airport, prior to the airport, or beyond the airport, just like the VOR. Most everything we said about the VOR approaches can apply to the NDB approach. Now, as you know, flying toward the NDB presents few problems, so let's eliminate those where the beacon is on or beyond the airport. Okay. That's when we track away from the facility, that's when things can unravel. Generally speaking, that's true. Now, when the NDB is associated with an ILS as a locator on a marker, or LOM, it is usually about five miles from the runway. So just make sure you cross directly over it and then just hold your heading from the beacon to the MAP. In about two minutes, you should be on the visual portion of the approach. But now take a look at the NDB approach to Palomar Airport in Carlsbad, California. Now here, the final segment is nearly 10 miles long. Most of these beacons are designed to give a reliable signal up to about 15 miles only. Now at 120 miles per hour, 100, 120 knots, it will take nearly five minutes to fly the final segment. Now, if you try to correct for every oscillation of the needle, confusion is assured. So, I do this. First, on the, f on the plan view, I mentally, or with a pencil, I'll draw a line through the beacon perpendicular to the final segment. Now, if I'm approaching the beacon from the non-airport sector of this uh, two semicircles, mm -hmm. I will cross the beacon at the prescribed altitude and turn to the inbound heading. If I'm on the airport side, I'll cross the beacon and make a course reversal. In this case, I would fly outbound at about 30 degrees to the inbound bearing on the maneuvering side of the holding pattern. Then after two minutes, I'd make a left turn and then head directly for the beacon. Now, incidentally, if radar vectors are being provided, once I am cleared for the approach, I don't necessarily follow the last heading given to me by ATC. Hmm. Now, too often that will not take me directly over the beacon, and of course it's meant to be advisory only after you're cleared for the approach. I just keep the needle right on the nose and head for the beacon. Hmm. Now, okay. it's very important that the approach begin from directly overhead the beacon. As I approach the beacon, I will stabilize and configure their aircraft for that final segment. I will carefully set the gyro if it is not slaved. As I cross directly over the beacon, I perform the six T's in this order, although some actions are done simultaneously. One is time, I start the clock. Okay. Two is turn, I turn to the inbound heading. Three is throttle, and I set that as required for the descent. Four, tires, which means I'm going to lower the landing gear. Five, talk. Now I do this after the aircraft is stabilized inbound. And six, I will track but I will wait one minute before I start tracking. Now, <clears throat> the reason I wait one minute is that any corrections prior to that, uh, the needle has not settled down and that would be over corrections. Incidentally, Jack, there are no warning flags on the ADF to tell you if the beacon or your receiver has failed on the final approach. Now, some indicators do go to the wingtip position in the case of failure, but others just freeze in position. 
So after you identify the beacon, leave the volume on low. If the sound stops, abandon the approach and investigate. Now, use your DME equipment whenever possible on an NDB approach. Now on the Palomar approach, for instance, if the DME is tuned to the Oceanside VOR, you can tell how close you are as you approach the NDB. Also, on the final segment, you have a pretty good idea how far you are from the runway by subtracting 10 miles from your indicated distance. Use all the equipment that can possibly be used on every instrument approach. Okay. Now, after one minute, take a look at the needle. If it is within five degrees of the tail, forget it and fly out the time. If it is more than five degrees off the tail, make a 20 degree correction toward the hemisphere in which the head of the needle is located. Hold that for about 20 seconds. Turn back to the inbound heading, and again, forget the needle while you fly out the time to the MAP. As the man on uh, TV says, Jack, it works for me. Oh, maybe it'll work for me too. Now, just a few words about localizer-only approaches. Localizers are considered to be lined up with the associated runway centerline. However, if the localizer is aligned within one or two degrees of the runway, then it is labeled an offset localizer. DME information may be provided from a VOR or a transmitter near the localizer antenna. Mm -hmm. As with an ILS, the course is three to six degrees wide. The exact width is calculated to produce a signal 700 feet wide at the threshold of the runway. In this in example here at San Luis Obispo, California, notice that the minimums are three quarters of a mile. Now that's about as low as you can get on a non-precision approach. Mm -hmm. Well, most ILS facilities will transmit a back course directly opposite the ILS signal. Now, some of these back courses have been flight tested and published as approved instrument approaches. The CDI reacts to the localizer signal the same way whether you're on a front course or a back course. So you must remember to fly away from the CDI needle during the back course approach. But Jack, you have an HSI. Mm -hmm. Now, if you reverse the CDI needle, that is, place the arrowhead at the bottom of the dial, it becomes directional, and now you can follow the CDI as you would on a front course approach. Keep in mind that the localizer course will be narrower and harder to fly as you near the airport. Now this is because the antenna is now on your end of the runway, and that 700 foot wide course is not going to be over the threshold, but a mile out on the final. A word of caution, Jack. Some localizers and LDA approaches use DME information. Sometimes the DME transmitter is part of the localizer approach, and sometimes it is provided by a different facility. Now here at Quincy, the DME information comes from a VOR beyond the airport. The MAP is located at 8.3 DME. At Pocatello, the DME information comes from a VOR on the final approach. The MAP is located at 2.9 DME beyond the VOR. A premature descent here might put you in the terrain short of the field. At Hayward, California, the DME is part of the system. The letters DME appear in the localizer frequency box. Now imagine what might happen if the DME equipment was left tuned to the Oakland VOR during the approach to uh, Hayward. Now all of these things have happened with unhappy results at airports with similar approaches. Let's take a look at the LDA approach, Jack. A localizer type directional aid can be used for a non-precision approach with the accuracy comparable to any localizer. However, it is not a part of an ILS system and it is not necessarily aligned with a runway. It may even be located at a different airport. For example, the Burbank, California ILS localizer is used for the Van Nuys LDAC approach. Incidentally, there are a few back course approaches and LDA approaches that have an electronic glide slope, but apparently these are being phased out. Now for the SDF approach. The simplified directional facility provides a final approach course similar to that of the ILS localizer, but it will never have a glide slope. Mm -hmm. You fly the SDF just as you would any localizer. However, the signal is wider and the final approach course is usually not lined up with a runway. The signal is fixed at either six or 12 degrees wide. The identifier will not be preceded by the letter I as localizers are. Now here at Elkhart, Indiana, we have an example of an SDF approach. Notice that there is a visual descent point, but more unusual, there's a back course SDF approach. I've gone into uh, Elkhart a couple of times and uh, haven't flown that uh, uh, approach, but have seen the charts. 
Now let's say a few words about area surveillance radar approaches. Okay. At fields where there are published ASR approaches, controllers are required to maintain ASR currency. And they're often willing to provide practice for pilots when their workload permits. Now I suggest that you request radar approaches so that when you must make one due to equipment failure, you'll be familiar with the procedures and phraseology used by the ASR controllers. Jack, did you know that there are published visual approaches? Mm -mm. Well, these approaches are used by ATC to expedite arrivals at some airports. In some cases, nav aids are used to aid in making the visual approach. Now, here are two examples of such approaches at San Francisco, California. They require as much study and attention to detail as any IFR approach. So I suggest that you be prepared to accept these approaches at airports where they are available. I, you know, I haven't uh, picked up your, the habits you suggested of uh, looking at all the approach plates. Uh, how important is that? And can you cite an example where it paid off? Sure. Last January, I was working on an instrument rating out of Van Nuys, California. As the student turned final, the controller asked the pilot to report Katie. Now, I could see the pilot growing tense as he tried to locate this reporting point. Tell him we are shooting a VOR approach, I said, since Katie was on the localizer. Oh, sorry, report Percy, said the controller. Now, that pilot had just about abandoned flying the plane and certainly could not have safely continued the approach if he did not understand the controller's request. One more case, Jack. The San Joaquin Valley is usually filled with fog about 1,500 feet thick in the wintertime. A good chance to give the instrument students some practice without using a hood. As we passed over the airport, I could see straight down, and we were just slightly left of the runway. Not bad for an NDB approach, but the pilot didn't commence the missed approach until nearly a mile north of the field. Now, at another field, that could have been very hazardous to his health. Sure. Now, it was his timing and his airspeed control. They were off a bit, and that often happens. So I told him I wanted the missed approach to begin at the runway threshold on the next attempt. Now, I doubted that his timing and speed control would improve that quickly, and so did he. So. We took a look at the VOR approach plate for runway 30 right. And here we found that the end of the runway was exactly 4.4 DME from the VOR. On the next try, the missed approach was executed precisely okay. at the MAP. So again, Jack, when making non-precision approaches, use DME data whenever possible and use the clock as a backup system. You know, Tony, this has been a long briefing session. During the airmanship departure briefing, we discussed the importance of a thorough pre-flight planning session, and ways to assure a good weather briefing, when to file a departure alternate airport, and other procedures to make the instrument departure safer. In the en route uh, session with airmanship, we covered communications and navigational problems, emergencies while on instruments, how best to handle icing, and how to stay in charge and make, well, command decisions. During the airmanship approach briefing, we talked about a precision ILS approach. We dissected the approach charts and reviewed the area chart. You told me how to develop a speed and configuration table for my aircraft. We, des we defined the approach gate, when to use the autopilot, and we also spell out the pilot's and the controller's responsibilities. Now, during this airmanship briefing on the non-precision approaches, we defined the approach segments and what the pilot should be doing in each segment. You covered some pilot techniques that I'm sure are going to help me in planning and executing an approach. You know, Tony, I'm going to ask for an instrument approach whenever feasible. And I'll use your speed and configuration table. I hope to visualize my position and have the aircraft stabilized before beginning the final segment. I feel I'm on my way to becoming a, a fairly competent instrument pilot. I'm going to be enjoying it more, Tony.